Hello, friends. Happy New Year. Wow, 2022. Crazy. Hope your holiday was great. We took some time off. Um, I took the week off, and it was really nice to have some time to hang with the family and just to do whatever we wanted to do. So it was great. Um, all right. I figured we'd start off this year with a bang, which is why I brought on Dr. Russell Moore to talk about evangelicalism, his story, the future of the church, and some of his views. Now, the thing I appreciate about Dr. Moore, even though we don't agree on a lot of things, is that he's very transparent and honest. He does identify as orthodox conservative, et cetera. But his view is that he is also seeing the evangelical church really progress, not into maybe a better way of being a church, but into this really weird um, far-right ideology. So I brought him on. So we talked about that. I, we kind of we got into his story a little bit. It was really a fun interview. I Like I said, I really appreciated him coming on. He knows our views. He knows that 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 we don't see eye to eye. And he was so um, just uh, polite and respectful and gracious. And I really enjoyed having him. So I figured, why not? Let's start off 2022 this way. Let's get Dr. Russell Moore on the show. I hope you enjoy the episode. That being said, of course, always want to say thank you to everyone who shares the show. We continue to expand. It is just, it is, um, I don't know what to say about that, right? Like I, I, I meet people who say, oh, I listen to your show and I love it. I go, wow, I'm thank you for letting me be in your ear for an hour. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. And I appreciate everyone who supports us. Thank you for, for sharing and subscribing and giving us ratings. It really just helps the podcast grow. If you want to help us financially, you can also do that. We are funding uh, the, to make the show better, to fund other parts of what New Evangelicals uh, does. We do a lot of other work, friends. The podcast is one part on top of helping people in all kinds of ways, whether it's Zoom groups, in-person meetups, uh, the creation of a documentary that we're working on. So if you want to help us out that way, you can do that. You can click on the link in our show notes and you can do it there. All right, friends, without further ado, here is my interview you with Dr. Moore. I hope you enjoy it. Talk to you all later. Well, um, Dr. Moore, it is truly an honor to have you on. Um, I've been I've been working on getting you on for a bit, and I'm glad that our schedule's finally aligned to make it happen. So thanks for making time to come on the show. Oh, well, I'm glad to be with you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Like I said before we started recording, you are one of my top uh, most frequently asked for guests. So to have you on, I think, means a lot to the community. Um, and I really appreciate you making time out of your very busy day. Um, I want to start here. I don't really know much about like your backstory. Like, like, how did you kind of get into the work that you do now? How did you grow up evangelical? Kind of give us give the audience some of that story. Yeah, I grew if you remember the uh, old statement back from the 90s evangelicals and Catholics together. I would often joke that I'm a product of literally an evangelical and a Catholic together. Uh, my <laughs> mom was from a Catholic family. My dad was a Southern Baptist pastor's son, uh, and my grandfather had pastored uh, the church that I grew up in. Uh, yeah, I grew up in Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, just over the state line from New Orleans, and uh, the community is uh, right on the coastline, much more New Orleans than what people think of when they think of Mississippi. Uh, so it's a majority Catholic, majority uh, immigrant um, community. And uh, my, um, my grandfather had been pastor of the church that I grew up in uh, long before I was uh, born. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so that, was, that was my background. So were you growing up in like evangelical spaces most of your time or this kind of weird hybrid where you're attending mass some Sundays or, or how, how, how did that kind of work? No, I was, I was uh, totally in uh, my Southern Baptist uh, context. Oh, so my okay. mother's side of the family uh, was was Catholic and and I think what that uh, what that gave to me was a sense of I could neither be anti-Catholic sort of uh, the Pope is the Antichrist sort of stuff that you would <laughs> That's hear I grew up. <laughs> yeah I, I, I couldn't do that uh, because I knew that wasn't true but I also uh, couldn't idealize uh, Rome in the mm. way that some of uh, some of my friends who were frustrated uh, evangelicals uh, later did and would say, well, if only we had um, a magisterium, then this would mm -hmm. solve all of these problems. And I couldn't sure. idealize it either because I could see um, I could see the, the flaws uh, present there as much as I could see the fact that these were um, these were really uh, wonderful uh, people. Uh, the right. Catholic side of the family was was great. And I also was able to. I saw a lot of uh, 
unbelievably good work coming out of um, out of Catholic parishes there. So it, it sort of uh, gave me a perspective that was neither idealization nor uh, demonization. I guess. Okay, fair enough. So d- would you consider yourself someone who, um, for lack of a, a better term, maybe made a profession of, of faith early on in life and was always kind of committed to being a follower of Jesus? Or, or was it kind of you were born in and kind of turned away and then kind of came back? I was always, um, I, I was always from a very young age, a, a follower of Christ. I did have a, uh, a, a spiritual crisis when I was 15 hmm. that, um, that was really dark. Um, I don't mm-hmm. think anybody would have known. It's, it's not as though I um, sort of went out and started uh, smoking weed and partying or something like that. Sure. Nothing like that. You would have never known that all of this was going on. It was it was happening at a subterranean level, but uh, and, and it wasn't an intellectual crisis. That wasn't where the problem was. Hmm. It was a uh, looking around and seeing Bible Belt Christianity. Not so much my church. Um, a, as looking out at the broader picture of evangelical Christianity and seeing uh, covered up scandals and seeing racism and seeing uh, politicization, all of those sorts of things, it really threw me to say, well, maybe, maybe this is all really just about uh, political mobilization or uh, power or something like that. And and that's what uh, that's what really put me into a, a deep uh, crisis and um, I would say a depression uh, over that for a while, which I'm I'm grateful for now looking back. Although I wouldn't want to go through it again. <laughs> yes, I understand. Uh, but <laughs> but yes. it was almost a, uh, almost a vaccination mm. of uh, the, the things that I went through at that time helped me to be able to. It was at a time where it was um, it was manageable enough, mm. but I was able to to kind of learn some things I would need later uh, when yeah. I would see that sort of thing. Yeah, I often call um, anxiety and depression and panic attacks, which I've also struggled with. The that moment in my life was was the greatest gift I never ever want again. <laughs> you right, know, like right, grateful right. for it, but let's not do that one again. It really, yeah. really grew my empathy among other things. Okay, so it sounds like I mean, for lack of a better term, it sounds like if if, if what was happening to you then was happening now, you'd probably be labeled in some realm of like deconstruction somehow because because those are a lot of like of like the main ingredients yeah. that have went into to my cake of deconstruction and that go to a lot of the audience's cake as well. So I want to kind of pick up this thread then. So you're going through this moment you're realizing things that a lot of us are still seeing today um you know politicization um racism scandals all that stuff um mm-hmm. and 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 then like what happened so what, what what kind of brings you out of that moment into where you kind of you know i, I guess onto the direction that you're going to launch it well I, as i said there wasn't uh, there wasn't a great deal of uh community in terms of talking this stuff through this was all yeah. uh internal to me and i right. don't think that i uh, I, I don't think that i mentioned it at all to literally anyone except wow. in a kind of vague way with my youth pastor who who handled it great actually mm. um but uh, but this was all sort of internal but what had uh, what had happened was I had read uh, the Chronicles of Narnia so many times as a kid hmm. that I recognized C.S. Lewis's name on the spine of Mere Christianity yeah. the bookstore. Took yeah. it home, and that was really uh, that was really pivotal for me. Not because of the uh, intellectual apologetics in Mere Christianity. Uh, I didn't have. That, that wasn't my problem, hmm. but it was because the sort of, um, for lack of a better word, tone of voice that Lewis had, yeah, uh, really similar to what, what these, these sorts of asides that he would do in uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, where of course you would never go into a wardrobe, you know, th- those sorts of things where he's kind of talking directly to you, and it's almost as though he's there. Yeah. Uh, that was present in a different way in Mere Christianity, but, yeah. but in a very similar way. And it was obvious that he wasn't trying to sell me anything, uh, this long dead figure that I was reading. Um, <laughs> right. and, 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 and it was different in a way that helped me 
to sort of move uh, to see a bigger and broader uh, vision of the kingdom of God. Um, and uh, and that that was what I needed uh, at the time hmm. because wow. I did not um, I was not somebody looking to um, I, I was not somebody looking to prodigal son uh, run away to the far country. Yes. Uh, I was more someone uh, in this sense of uh, fear of being in a sort of M Night Shyamalan version of the parable of the prodigal son, where <laughs> oh, we've been in the far country all along. I mean, that was the that <laughs> yeah. was the, plot that twist. Was the, yeah, yeah. So, so at what point did you decide I want to really devote my life to being in this world of of evangelical Christian thought? Because obviously now you're pretty well established. You've been around for a long time, doing a lot mm -hmm. of different things. I think right now you're you're with Christianity uh, Christianity Today, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what what what's what was the moment for you where you said, I want to really pursue this? Well, I had, um, I had experienced a drawing toward uh, ministry really early. I mean, I, I remember going to my pastor as maybe a 12 year old mm -hmm. and saying, I think maybe uh, God's calling me to ministry. Yeah. And his response was to say, okay, well, in three weeks, we're going to have a youth night and you'll preach. And I said, oh, I don't mean now. Right. I mean, and, and he said, yeah, but this will yeah, I'll help you so sort of throw you uh, in. Trial by fire. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so That's I great. did I did that. And uh, it was a really anxiety provoking sort of uh, sort of event. I went into the little uh, room next to the baptistry and threw up, went out, preached, <laughs> then went back and threw up again uh, after that. But oh, uh, as, as time went on, um, not really coinciding with the spiritual crisis, but more just in terms of I was looking around at the models of what I was supposed to be as a uh, Baptist preacher. And I mm. couldn't see, I couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't see myself uh, mm. there. Um, mm. Yeah. And so there were, uh, so I sort of thought, well, maybe this then just isn't, it isn't what I'm supposed to do. So I started um, moving into, I was working in the political arena. Um, and so I was, um, uh, uh, started out as an intern and then became a staffer and then became a campaign communications director for hmm. a United States congressman and was doing that uh, for a while. And then uh, started to, I, I was, I think the key moment was um, I was on Capitol Hill and had was over at the Library of Congress where uh, you could take discard books um, mm. that, that they would uh, allow you to take. Mm. And I picked up this little uh, manual on weddings and funerals. And okay. I remember thinking, why did I, well, you know, it was just one of those that you just picked up and then it wasn't until I got home that I thought, what, what was going on? Why did I <laughs> yeah. subconsciously want this? Right. That sort of provoked a rethinking and a rediscovery of, uh, of this. And so it, it was just a, a long process. Wow. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. You know, I think it's important for people to know how people get to where they are, right? Because it's so easy to make people, especially in the world of social media or people who are in media content, just to become like this other thing that isn't really human. <laughs> you right. know, and it's so yeah. important to humanize people's stories because everyone has a story, has a journey. Um, so, you know, obviously I, I think you know a little bit about us and kind of our community is really dealing with the modern term is deconstruction. There's of course many other terms. Some people, some people call it disentanglement. Some call it um, disorientation. That, that's the term that, that Pete Enns uses. And a lot of us um, have found that um, we're really just seeing more and more and more and more and more how the, for lack of a better term, it's, it's, it's a little broad, but the American evangelical church, that, that's what I kind of call it. It really is still, um, kind of in bed with a lot of the things that, that you at 15 saw, <laughs> maybe mm -hmm. even more so in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so for you, you know, now an adult, now in, in, in this in this world of ministry at some point, what was the moment for you that 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 maybe you started seeing some of the same things repeating themselves again, where you're like, oh my God, I, I was seeing this at 15 or thinking about it and now I'm seeing it again. Now, what do I do with this? Uh, well, I don't know that there was a time where I would say, uh, here it is, and then it's gone, and here it is uh, re reappearing. I'm not okay. sure that that's the way that it happened. As mm. much as it was 
at 15, I started to sort of see what was going on mm. and uh, started to have categories for understanding that. Mm. And so it, um, I suppose, I mean, Walker Percy has been a, a big influence on my life. And um, he did this uh, interview with himself one time where he's okay. asking himself the questions that he wished other people would ask. And one of them is, um, why are you a Catholic? And he says, because I believe that what the Catholic Church proposes about itself is true. Mm. Um, well, I think I came to the point where I realized that what American evangelical Christianity proposed about Jesus is true. Mm. But what American evangelical Christianity often proposed about itself was not. Mm. Uh, and so I, I learned to sort of differentiate between those or came to differentiate between those things um, at that time. Mm. So I think it was I think it was less that I encountered something and then encountered it again as much as that I had a um, I had what I would consider the right kind of disillusionment mm. um, at the right time, but mm. without for all sorts of reasons. And one sure. of those reasons being uh, that there was a community around me that was a flawed, uh, no question about that, flawed uh, uh, church community, but hmm. uh, where I really did see grace. Hmm. And I really did, uh, I really did experience people who uh, often were living out the hymns they sang mm. um, in extraordinary ways. And so the, all of those things, I think, uh, yeah. I think work together. Yeah, that's really good. So let's get some of your thoughts on the more modern, I guess, deconstruction movement. I hate to use that term. It's so broad. So mm -hmm. I, I, I want to narrow it down for a minute, because obviously, you know, the way I describe it to people, whenever they ask me, what's deconstruction? I say, well, that, that's like asking, what is music? <laughs> Depends on, yeah. on what you're talking about, instrumentation, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, so for our sake, the way that I, we, we talk about deconstruction is it's people who are uh, were brought up in church or, or in the evangelical institution and who are really rethinking uh, things that, that that they were taught were absolutely true and saying, well, is that is that an absolute fact? I mean, a, a case in point would be if you don't receive Christ one day, you will definitely burn in hell forever and ever and ever and ever. And we go, OK, is that like how it works? You know, you don't say the right words and you're going to end up burning forever. So for for so deconstruction in that sense is really people who are trying to stay committed to the way of Jesus and are finding themselves more and more at odds with the evangelical institution um, for many, many reasons. So base, I, I feel like you have a really unique, uh, you're in a, a very unique uh, position where you kind of have your foot a little bit in both worlds. You're, you're, you, are, you are respected with, with uh, a lot of people who would see themselves as deconstruction, myself included, uh, but you also still um, have a lot of um, influence and a lot of, uh, um, you know, just, um, yeah, I guess influence in like in more evangelical circles as well. So I feel like you, you kind of have a both and perspective here. Give, give me some of your thoughts on, from someone on maybe the outside looking in on what you're seeing in the modern deconstruction movement right now. Well, I mean, again, as you said, it's really hard to say that because it's such a broad, uh, such a broad term. When somebody says to me, I think I'm going through a time of deconstruction, it can mean any, you know, anything of maybe a hundred things. <laughs> right. But for some people, what that means is uh, I'm becoming an atheist and, um, and, and that's where I'm headed either all at once or a little bit at a time. Uh, for some people, it means I'm kind of going through a uh, what the Amish would call rumspringa of sort of just uh, taking taking a few years and just sort of venting uh, everything <laughs> that I ever wanted to do and couldn't yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and then for some people, it's I'm just um, I'm just stepping back and saying how much of what I believe. Uh, it, it, do I really believe how much of it, uh, how much of it do I own at the heart level and how much of it is, have I simply assumed? Yeah. And then for some people, what they mean by deconstruction is simply what um, Martin Luther would have called reformation. They're, they're just, yeah. they're, they're looking at whatever their particular church tradition was and saying, does this actually line up with scripture? Yeah. So it could be it could be any number of those things. And sometimes 
I've seen people sort of moving in various uh, in various categories, uh, yep. you know, at, at different times. Yep. And so I almost don't ever even use the word. I just don't think it's very useful. Instead, what I say to people is, "What's what's going on with you?" Mm. And, uh, and and so for some people, what they're going to want to talk about um, is they had a traumatic uh, church experience. Uh, I have too. I understand that. Mm. Uh, or uh, they're saying, I'm just, uh, I'm at a point where uh, I'm having some intellectual uh, doubts, or I mean, any number of questions uh, going on, how, yeah. how can how can I understand what's happening? Uh, yeah. in my, I mean, it could just, it could just, it could just be any number of things. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, from where I am, um, I'm I'm someone who has has never deconstructed. If mm-hmm. you, uh, I, I'm someone who um, maybe spent some time examining the blueprints of the house mm-hmm. <laughs> and yep. and uh, yep. it's sort of uh, checking the checking the solidity of the walls and those sorts of things. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But but didn't uh, but didn't deconstruct. And I mean, um, I'm and. Uh, and a very uh, theologically conservative Orthodox um, evangelical Christian who's a Catholic. I'm a small mm. C Catholic. <laughs> I mean, I, I really do think that I think that the church, broadly speaking, has um, has in a flawed uh, way or has has given witness to something that is real, or more importantly, someone who is real. So I really do believe the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed, and I think that uh, when when we look at uh, a lot of what I have seen sort of behind the veil uh, yep. in church life, which is uh, often horrifically awful, yeah. Um, you know, I've never thought about it until now, uh, r- literally right now while we're saying this. But I think one of the things that maybe uh, in an ironic kind of way helped me mm. was the prophecy chart preaching that I heard as a kid, which was one of the problems. You know, so so <laughs> one of the one of the reasons for the fifteen year old crisis is because I grew up in this. A uh, very dispensationalist, uh, prophecy-oriented mm. uh, sort of uh, world, where there would be a lot of preaching on, you know, here's uh, here's this red heifer that's being uh, farmed, and that's what's going to be sacrificed in the rebuilt temple, or Gog and Magog refers to, you know, all all of those sorts of things, <clears throat> and I would notice the fact that uh, many of these really, really certain predictions, uh, when they would not take place, what would happen is not that people would say, you know what, we were wrong. Turns out uh, Gog and Magog must not be the Soviet Union because the Soviet (laughs) Union doesn't exist now. Uh, None of that happened. It was just sort of move right on to the next uh, really (laughs) confident sort of uh, prophecy. So that was... That was a problem, but it also was a sense where I did spend time uh, in evaluating all of that in passages of scripture where Jesus is actually warning about the mm. things, the things mm. that his church could do. Yeah. Or, you know, if you're spending a lot of time in the book of Revelation, um, you know, maybe what people are wanting to do is to talk about how uh, sackcloth of hair is a nuclear bomb and whatever. Right. But you also spend some time then looking at Revelation 1 through 3 and realizing Jesus really never promised an idyllic, uh, faithful church. He, he, was, he was warning and, and calling for accountability for the church all along. So that I think that was able to give enough differentiation between Jesus from whatever might have been in front of me at the moment yeah, uh, in, in ways that were, were at least to me helpful. So that is helpful. Now, so here's my question then for you. 
my question is, do you feel like the modern evangelical church in America is a faithful representation to the church? Now, what I, I want to unpack that for a second, and I'll give you the floor again. I recognize that you're right. No, nothing in this life is perfect. We're all aware of that. No matter how much we want to aim for the ideal, there's always going to be issues. We, 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 I think everyone listening to this podcast understands that because we're a part of that problem at times, right? I've been complicit in that. So have you, and so have our, mm-hmm. so has the audience. But it just seems like, Right. I, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm asking is, when do we know? Okay, it's time to reform. It's, it's time to it's time to bring in a Martin Luther and say this has got to get completely reshaped going forward. Versus, okay, we have to stay and try and just make what's happening better because the last year we've gotten about 10,000 DMs, give or take, um, in our Instagram account. And the story after story of, I mean, all different things, but they all yeah. center around very common denominators, abuse, um, emotional abuse, gaslighting, horrible end times theology, giving people panic attacks for life, um, abusers being platformed and then moved around and platformed. And it's not just one denomination. That's why I use the term American Evangelical Church. We see mm-hmm. it in the IFB, in the AG. I mean, we, you name it, it's there. And it just mm-hmm. seems like, like at this moment, and I, I, I don't want to overemphasize the moment because moments happen all throughout history, but in our cultural moment, it really seems like there is a, a, a massive um, wake up call and awakening to the rampant um, consistent platforming of abusive people in leadership with little to no consequence. Now, I'm, what I'm going to say is that you, you don't have to comment on this part if you don't want to, but I'll say it. You know, the, re- the recent podcast, Rise and Fall of Mars Hill podcast, you know, the Mark Driscoll, I'm sure you're aware of all that. He still mm-hmm. has a church. He is still teaching. I mm-hmm. have pastors in my area who go to visit him to get influenced by him. I've mm-hmm. asked for conversations with those pastors. They haven't happened yet. You know, but my, my point is while people like Mark are still out there, making money, saying whatever they say, um, people like us who are questioning if maybe the church is wrong on, 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 uh, on how they view the queer community are being asked to now leave those spaces because we're all of a sudden unorthodox or we're to whatever it is for people. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very frustrating when, 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 when we see this happening because I'm trying as best as I can to be faithful to Jesus, to recognize that the blessing of God is, is going outward, not inward, right? And then my church says, hey, sorry, that's too problematic. You have to step down. But then we look at, at, at the broad you know, scope of American culture or American evangelical culture. And we go, oh my gosh, there's just a person after a person who's still in these spaces. So do you think this is worth saving at this point? I wrestle with this. Some days I'm like, yes, that's why we're called new evangelicals. Mm-hmm. Other days I'm like, give me the Molotov cocktail. I'll be the first one to throw it in, in, in the building, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so what are some of your thoughts on that? Well, I don't think there's any such thing as the American evangelical church. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, I think that what the word evangelical is intended to be is a descriptor for a particular kind of renewal movement within the broader body of Christ. Okay. And so I, I, I think it's, um, I think it's always been kind of ridiculous to uh, fit this generic category uh, where both uh, Kenneth Copeland and Shane Claiborne belong. Um, and James Paula, White. And James <laughs> White. All and, in there. and Paula White. You, right. know, uh, you know, that, right. that's, that's kind of, um, it, that it's necessary because you have to, you have to sort of differentiate to say, well, here's what we're talking about um, to some degree. Uh, and it's, it's the fault uh, in, in most cases, the fault of, it's our fault uh, as evangelical Christians because you can't have it both ways. You can't both say uh, we're you know, forty million strong. Uh, we're we're this right. many people, and to say, oh well, wait, we're not. You know, right. the craziness that you need with Paula White. I mean, that that is our right. our fault. Uh, <laughs> That's exactly. There. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, uh, I mean, I think the question comes down to ultimately. Um, if you, before you ask what's worth saving yeah, and how do we, uh, go about reforming it? I think the question is, um, what is true and, and, and who is truthful at, at least asking that question. So I think what, what ultimately has to be the starting place is a sense of, uh, authority 
uh, as opposed to power. So when, when I'm using authority, I'm using it the way uh, the sociologist Robert Nisbet used to talk about, um, used to talk about where there's a breakdown of authority, meaning organic, persuasive um, uh, uh, ability, then what you're going to end up with is coercion because the the void is going to be there and then there's going to be authoritarianism so hmm. coercive uh, coercive power hmm. and i think that's i think that's true so i think i think the question has to come down to um in order to ask where do i think this should go yeah i i have to have some sense of who is who is directing this? I mean, so I, I really right. do think this has to start with uh, Christology to say, uh, which ought to bring both a much more critical eye toward uh, the body of Christ, to say this is supposed to be an embodiment and a representation of Jesus and often is not. Hmm. Uh, and then to say, uh, and, and to give, uh, and to give, love for the body of Christ and to say, okay, at the end of the Reformation, uh, whatever Reformation I'm, I'm talking about here, what, right. what more or less is that to look like? Right. And I think we're going to come down at, uh, I think we're going to come down at different places there. Yeah. So for, for me, uh, and I'm just speaking for myself, not for anybody else. Sure. Uh, for me, the problem that I have with uh, American evangelicalism is not that it's too theologically or morally rigid. Mm -hmm. It's that it's not theologically or morally, for lack of a better word, conservative enough. Mm. Uh, I, I think that uh, I, uh, Christian nationalism, for instance, yeah. is, is, not, um, is not a manifestation of evangelicalism becoming more and more and more orthodox. Hmm. It's Christian nationalism is heresy. And, uh, and the reason, I mean, you, you were talking about, I think we would um, have different uh, views on hell, uh, probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I reject Christian nationalism partly because I do believe in hell. Hmm. Uh, hmm. And because I think that the stakes are, uh, the stakes are high. Hmm. Are, are too high for uh, Christianity to be turned into a, a means to an end, which hmm. I think is the fundamental problem. Hmm. Is, is, yes. is when Christianity is turned into a means to an end, whatever that end is. A liberal critique, that was Jay Gresham's critique in uh, the 1920s uh, of saying it doesn't matter uh, what the means to an end, what the end is, if it's uh, fighting communism or if it's, you know, whatever else, once the Christianity becomes the way to get there and, and then becomes an ability to manipulate people in order to get where you want to go, then you've ended up with something that's very dangerous at a human level, but you've also ended up with something that's very heretical uh, hmm. uh, based upon uh, what uh, on the, the the creeds of the church and based upon the content of scripture. Mm -hmm. And so I think you have to say, you know, where are we, where are we headed here? And so if you look at the, if you look at the model of the Reformation, um, I, I guess the question is, uh, there, there are multiple different models of Reformation there. So you, you have Luther and mm -hmm. Calvin, who mm -hmm. at the beginning uh, aren't wanting to right. create an alternative to the Roman Catholic Church. They want to remain uh, within the church, but to see the church stop selling indulgences and so forth. It, it's when the church starts excommunicating them that, that they are finding other, other ways to be the church. Right. Uh, that's very different from, say, the Munster Rebellion. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think you, I think you, have, to, you have to ask you know, where are we ultimately wanting to go? And when I say you have to ask, I don't mean that every individual, mm. because we don't, you know, often, often we're going through a time where uh, we're disoriented or we're, we're rethinking or we're grieving. And, you know, no, no one should rush you through that 
uh, process. I don't think that that's, uh, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you particularly as an individual need to know what the church ought to look like uh, in 10 years. <laughs> but, but I do think that you, I do think that it's necessary at some point to ask, um, what do I think the end goal uh, is here? Yeah. And, and uh, for some people, um, that end goal is to say, uh, what I want, uh, where I think we ought to go is something that um, looks uh, very much like um, secularization. For some people, they're going to say what, what I want looks very much like uh, liberal mainline Protestantism. For some people, it's going to say what I, what I think it should look like is something more like a uh, an inquisition less medieval Catholicism. For me, um, what I would like to see is an evangelical Christianity that's genuinely evangelical and genuinely Christian, <laughs> and uh, and that actually believes what it what it says it it believes. Yeah, uh, and you know, so I think that's that's a key part of it. Yeah, that's that, that's all fair, and I appreciate you saying those things. And you know, one of the reasons why I wanted you on is because I knew we would have different perspectives, and people need to be exposed to different perspectives. I mean, that's very yeah. important with the work that we're trying to do here, because we don't want to become fundamentalists all over again. You know, I mean, a lot of us yeah. have let, have come out of fundamentalism, and I can see the allure to do it all over again, just in a whole different way. Um, but we need a diversity of thought. We need wisdom. We need people like yourself who who have read and studied and are well educated in these matters and can offer a lot of perspective. You know, I really think that one of the reasons it's easy for myself and for others to kind of not claim to be another Martin Luther. That is not the point, but but to mm -hmm. at least identify with that kind of journey of of Martin Luther and Calvin wanted to stay inside the Catholic Church and eventually got kicked out, and then the Reformation happened is because yeah. in that way that's what happened to us. <laughs> you know, like it, mm -hmm. it can't be overstated that for I would argue for most people that we're seeing exploding in this deconstruction space again, for lack of a better word were people who really wanted to help be the change from the inside out, really wanted to help make the push the church forward to make it healthier. They saw what happened in 2016. They saw the Jerry Falwell Jr. saying, we need a yeah. commander in chief, not a pastor in chief, and the evangelicals following in lockstep. And we've experienced that in our own churches. I mean, I had people in my church before I was asked to leave, you know, who were straight up QAnon conspiracy, uh, conspiracy people, you know, mm -hmm. saying it from their Facebook accounts on the board of the church. Um, and so when that stuff happens, I think a lot of us were thinking we want a more faithful expression of church as well. We want a more faithful way of, of following the way of Jesus. And we end up reading the Beatitudes or Matthew 25, right, where, where Jesus is literally telling people, beware of judgment, lest you take care of the poor, you know, like take care mm -hmm. of the poor or else kind of thing. And we mm -hmm. go and we go, hmm. That's pretty direct, but there isn't much. There isn't much in this about you know light shows and 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 big multi church you know me mega church worship events. But there's a lot mm -hmm. about feeding the poor here. What do we mm -hmm. do with this, right? Right. So I, I think a lot of people. I think that 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 there are people in evangelical spaces who are either intentionally or or just ignorantly misrepresenting a big reason why a lot of people are speaking out the way that the way that that they are when it comes to the evangelical church and their criti their criticism of it. You know, we're called we're told deconstruction is sexy, it's for street cred, etc. And we're like, no, it's not. I didn't even ask for this. I lost sexy? that is yeah, well that was yeah. a Matt Chandler thing that he said recently oh. that has kind of taken the world by storm, you know. Mm -hmm. But that was the thing he said. He um and I I think a lot of us are like, well, this has cost us everything. I have no friends, Russell. All right. My mm -hmm. my church community disappeared in four months after spending six years with them all in as a volunteer. I was there all the time. In four months, those relationships are totally dissolved. And I am i am honestly a very um, soft casualty compared to other stories that I've heard. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of us are looking at you and we're desperate. We're, we're hungry, right, to experience this Jesus that we're taught about, the one who loves the marginalized, the one who offers healing and redemption and beauty into the world. And mm -hmm. we want to be part of that. And we look at the, I know you don't like the term, but the American Evangelical Church, mm -hmm. and we go, hmm, they're the least likely to get vaccinated. They're huge QAnon conspiracy. The insurrection had Jesus language and was mainly, you know, it was largely downplayed by, by many mainline leaders. We're seeing these prophets come out of nowhere about how Trump is going to get elected again. And, mm -hmm. and, and people are too busy talking about CRT, you know, than, yeah. than, than really critiquing this. I think right. that's where our frustration really lies. Yeah, well, and, and my frustration too.
yeah. the, the question is just, um, I think the question comes down to though, how, um, how do you, what is the alternative in your mind? And again, again, you don't, you don't necessarily have to know what it is. Sometimes the first step is to say, I see something that is, um, that is obviously wrong. Selling indulgences is wrong. Mm. Um, you know, and I, I, I'm starting to wonder what that is. You don't have to have all of that figured out, mm. but I do think that eventually yeah. there has to be a question of, of what is the alternative. So for me, yeah. uh, as somebody who genuinely believes the stuff, uh, and I'm a conservative evangelical, um, uh, Orthodox Christian, I have to say, what do I do? Hmm. And the question is, uh, how much, you know, one of the frustrations that I had in, um, in the denomination that I grew up in and was always in until this year, yeah, Southern yeah. Baptist Convention, is, yeah. that, um, is that most of the people I think in terms of um, kind of your, your regular uh, person in the pew yeah, are good people. They want to mm -hmm. follow Jesus. They don't have any idea what's <laughs> going on behind the scenes, you know, right. in many of these, uh, in many of these cases. Right. Um, and so I would I said to a journalist one time, cause I was speaking very positively about my, uh, the denomination in which I grew up. And he said, why do you do that? And I said, well, because I mean, 95% of the people are great. Hmm. Uh, and he said, well, I think your math's off. <laughs> and I said, well, maybe, but, but, you know, uh, most of the people are, are, uh, are, are great people, yeah. but you've got this, uh, this other group of people. Uh, and I've seen this take place in multiple denominations and in multiple congregations. Yeah. You've got a group of people who are willing to do anything in order to sort of carry out a kind of psychological warfare yeah and yes. who uh and who really uh really do want to sort of take the best aspects of creedalism and flip it mm. so w what creeds are always intended to do is to not only provide uh, a sense of consensus are we all on the same page in terms of the broad mission yeah, I mean, and everybody has that. If if for no other reason, you're not if you're not sacrificing a goat on the communion table, then you have some sort of of creedal consensus. <laughs> right. uh, but it also is to say, uh, then uh, where are the where are the places where we have genuine diversity and we don't have to all uh, be on the same page? When right. that's consistently and constantly narrowing, um, then that becomes that becomes impossible. So uh, yes. you, you end up with a situation where someone who, um, I mean, I, I have, not only have I not deconstructed with some uh, minor exceptions on some sort of tertiary kinds of issues, I'm exactly who I was at 15 on the other mm. side of the crisis, <laughs> mm. you know, but, you know, if, if there's this, um, sense of constant narrowing, then um, suddenly the, the next, uh, the, the next person gets to be the liberal, uh, right. even when, even when that person is not, uh, is not liberal at all. <laughs> right. uh, and so I think mm. that, and, and that works the other way too. I mean, there are, there are a lot of people in mainline Protestant denominations who will say to me, you know, all of a sudden I'm a fundamentalist and I haven't, uh, I haven't changed at all. I'm right. still <laughs> it's the right. same, same kind of Episcopalian I was uh, before, but the, the church has moved on. I mean, I think, I think you, I think the question comes down to um, sometimes the answer is to say, I have to leave hmm. because if I don't leave, I'm going to be complicit in what's taking place. Hmm. Sometimes the answer is to stay mm -hmm. because uh, if I, if I self exile, um, you know, there was a, a, a a really important study done on social media 
mm-hmm. um, showing that most uh, most people on social media are actually, for lack of a better word, kind of moderate. But they're the people who self-censor mm. for all sorts of reasons because they have more to lose. They're not people who live, you know, all the time online. Yeah. Uh, and because they have a different sort of psychology and mindset. And so they step back. And what that means is that you sort of surrender Twitter to the trolls. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I think the same thing often happens in, in church life. Yeah. And there are some difficult decisions uh, that have to come in to say, wait a minute, is my staying an abdication of responsibility or is my leaving an abd- abdication of responsibility? And sometimes that's a very difficult, mm. uh, difficult question. For, yeah. for me, uh, it was both. And I may, I may, have, been, I may have been wrong uh, mm. in, in, in the way that I worked through this, but I, I realized I am an evangelical Christian, uh, an Orthodox Christian. I'm, I'm not walking away from that. I'm not going to abandon that to grifters and hucksters um, right. and so forth. Um, but I'm also not going to sort of be the face for a particular expression of that that yeah. that I think uh, that I think is hurting people in a mm. lot of ways. And so mm. you had to you sort of had to make that decision. And I think that's, you know, again, it's one of the reasons it took me so long um, not to make the first part of the decision, the staying part that that had, you know, that that was many years in, in the making. Right. But the, the second part, the reason it took so long is because I was checking my own motives to say, um, you know, am I just saying I quit and uh, it's not worth uh, it, it's not worth sort of um, dealing with people that um, th- that I think are quite alien to mm. not only the uh, not only uh, to the Gospels, but also to uh, to the stated purposes of this. Uh, expression of the church and the wishes of most of the people. I mean, you have to work that through and it's not easy uh, to make those determinations. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, honestly, there's a reason why I kept the evangelical name too. I'm kind of too stubborn (laughs) to to, to let it go to the wayside of Christian nationalism. And I read a a really uh, great book. I actually have it here. um, Discovering an Evangelical Heritage by Donald Dayton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Great read, you know, talking about Mm -hmm. the early early Wesleyan tradition. They were uh, abolitionists, egalitarian, like real radicals for their time. And I'm Mm -hmm. reading this. I'm like, this is the evangelicalism like I'm I'm drawn to, right? Like, how do Mm -hmm. we reclaim some of this goodness, some of this this radical um how do we see the gospel through the lens of helping not only society but also the individual this really both and approach to things and so you know a lot of people ask me why do i keep the evangelical name and and i tell them this book really helped me form that because there is some hope there and honestly evangelical means to be someone who brings good news i hope we have good news to bring people Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. um okay so we have just a few minutes left i i have something i think a little fun that we can do before we we have you sign off so i know that on your podcast you do this thing you did it with shane claiborne uh where you pretty much say like tell me you're wrong without telling me I'm wrong kind of thing. Right. Where, where I, it's tell, tell me I'm wrong by telling me I'm wrong. <laughs> and you, and you, you can't, you can't push back. You just have to ask questions. Right. right? All right. So right. we're going to flip it. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you my thoughts for a future church and I'll let you tell me where I'm wrong. And all I can do is ask more questions until okay. our time's up. So about, about 10 minutes. Is that cool with uh, you? Sure. All right, here we go. So, so I have been thinking, I'm actually most passionate about the church. That that's what started all of this, even decades ago. Um, for me, the way I see things now is that the evangelical church um, is is primarily event centered. Okay, so so people center around an event, the event of, of the worship gathering, the event of whatever it is. That's where most of the time, the resource, the money, the volunteer hours are spent. I think that we have to figure out ways to become a community centered movement. So, uh, so not so much the big event, although as a a professional musician, I love that those moments, they don't get me wrong, I I love them very much. But I feel like the evangelical movement is just too corporatized, it's almost too culturized in that sense of of how we've organized this like top down structure, that doesn't allow really the priesthood of all believers, it doesn't allow the gifts that everyone has of teacher, apostle, prophet, evangelist to be really um, um, practiced, because we really 
have um, given up that to the paid staff, so to speak. So I think part of what I'm seeing, and I haven't, ha- I don't have it all worked out yet, though, is how do we recenter a church that is focused on loving God and loving their neighbor in small communities around their neighborhoods that are plugged into those communities for the flourishing of all humanity? I think that the gospel points to that. I think that that Jesus was talking about things, yes, maybe um, out there, but also very much here and right now. The kingdom is here, God is here, etc. So for me, I feel like and I believe that 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 for the church to really begin to move forward in a more healthy expression that also changes the perspective of of our society, which we all know sees us very negatively as evangelicals, is that we really start thinking about instead of this mega corporatized system, these industries that we've created, we really start thinking about how do we create actual friend groups, people who are friends in real life, you know, who do things together, who are centered on Jesus and loving their neighbor together. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't disagree with anything that you said there at the, um, at, at least at the literal level. It might be in, in terms of how that plays out. There might be some differences, but I think that's, I think that's right. Although I would say, as with almost everything, um, I think the, I think the danger that we have is primarily uh, one of two things replacing what should be an either or with a both and i think there are you know you, it can't be both god and mammon i think that's uh, that's a, but the other is true too replacing a both and with an either or um you're exactly right that uh, church has become uh event uh exclusive in many in many ways um there is a place for I mean, Pentecost is an event. <laughs> it's, yes. uh, it, it starts with something small and organic prayer meeting, and it and it results in something that's that's small and and proliferating and organic. But it is it is an event. I I do think that that's necessary. The question is, the question is how do you get there? And I think that part of the way that you get there is with this sense of um, frustration that people have of saying there, there has to be more to life together uh, in the church than what we're seeing right now, allowing that frustration to, to work itself out. And so sometimes, sometimes what you have are churches that uh, are very much what you described, corporate, uh, you know, just, just, uh, just event sort of uh, uh, based, and they're always going to be that way. Uh, but there are other churches that don't know the alternative. I mean, there, there are a lot of churches that are saying um, would, would really like to do things differently, but they don't know what to do, and they haven't seen a lot of models. And so I've seen things change in a positive direction, in a negative direction too, but I've seen things change in a positive direction where you just have small small groups of people or small congregations that are saying, here's a way that you can do this uh, in a way that then becomes replicable uh, by, by other people. So, I mean, I, I was dealing with that a lot with um, working in sort of orphan care, foster care space. Um, I would often encounter people who would say, our church just doesn't get it. Um, and sometimes they were right. Sometimes our churches didn't get it, never would. Sometimes you had a situation where the, the church just didn't know how to. And so what I would say is rather than go in and say, you need to get on board, mm-hmm. uh, go in and say, here's what we would like to do. Uh, would you bless it mm-hmm. and start small and, and move forward? And, and many times that works. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that I think there are sort of different kinds of problems with getting to where you're you're talking about right now, mm-hmm. and you have to almost distinguish, you know, which sort of setting am I in? Right. Do you think that, generally speaking, there are many exceptions to this rule, that the evangelical church does try to worship both God and Mammon? I'm thinking about the 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 you know um, name it and claim it culture. I'm thinking about mega church yeah. culture. I'm thinking about churches that try to become mega churches. You know how we've seen the tithe abused. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think I think the church always has hmm. had that uh, had that uh, had that pull. Um, I, I think that's uh, I think you can look at uh, 
every uh, iteration of church life from the first century uh, on. I mean, this is the reason that we have epistles is, mm. is in the New Testament is largely <laughs> to say, what are you doing? Right. Um, and so I do think that that's, uh, that's, definitely, that's definitely the case, mm. um, which means that there has to be a, a church reformed and always reforming according to mm-hmm. the word of God. Mm-hmm. How do you think, um, how do you think we channel our inner prophet in a way um, while not losing people in this process? That's what I wrestle with the most. You know, yeah, I would love to burn down the buildings, but there are people inside of it and people matter to God. They're made in the mm-hmm. Imago Dei. Um, where do you find yourself drawing lines of, Hey, um, you know, I'm going to think about this because there are people involved versus, Hey, this is just wrong. I'm going to, I'm going to say something regardless of the fallout. Well, again, it, those are sometimes not easy decisions to make and, yeah. and, and, you know, in terms of what's right. And sometimes you're going to make a mistake. Yeah. Uh, you know, I certainly have, there are, Same. there are times where I've, I've said, you know, maybe if I'd been a little more patient. Um, on this particular thing, then we could have uh, we could have moved uh, forward with it. And there are other times where I've said uh, I was far too patient in a way mm. that led to complacency um, mm. uh, here. And you know, so you're going to make mistakes, and you just have to recognize those and and learn from them. Yeah. But I think the, I mean, I think the the model is this very complicated yeah. uh, Jesus yeah. who is doing two things at once. On the one hand, he's sort of very patiently bringing the disciples along, answering a lot of <laughs> yeah. questions with, well, come see, come and yeah. see. Yeah. Uh, and, and, then, and then sort of strategically teaching as he's moving them along. And then you have a Jesus who is at times saying things that are shockingly uh counter expectation unless mm-hmm. you you know, chew on my skin and drink my blood you can't i mean that is <laughs> pretty freaks <intense>. everybody out <laughs> i mean so so i think jesus is very complicated in that way yeah and uh and we have to at least aspire to the same thing of yeah. knowing uh of knowing when what we're doing is going to break a bruised reed and and snuff out a, a a flickering wick. Yeah. Or when what we're doing is um simply enabling and empowering uh unhealthy and yep. and awful things. Yep. That's 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 sometimes really complicated. That's why we need each other. I love how uh, Tim Mackey in the Bible Project puts it. You know, we have to trust and work with God's wisdom to make wise decisions. I love that. Yeah. Like, that's just beautiful. It's so well said. Um, yeah. This is great. I really appreciate you making time to hang out with me and to talk. And I think one thing we both agree on, I'm sure we agree on a lot of things, but one of the things I think big time at, towards the end of this conversation is you're right. These things are complicated. And I think um, our social media culture loves to make things overtly black and white. Certainly there are moments where it's like, yes, this is very clear. <laughs> but in a lot of ways, humans are nuanced. My wife and I were even discussing this the other day in the car, just that they're complicated and people that you might think are bad are not all bad. And people you think are good are not all good. They're, they're really nuanced. And there's a lot of, a lot of um, complications to that. And so that should make us always tread lightly and err on the side of, of love and of grace. So. Um, yeah. And it also, yeah. it also forces, I mean, I think about if I had had, um, an immediate social media sort of presence when I was going through that crisis as a 15 year old, mm. um, I wouldn't have actually been able to go through the crisis. Uh, mm. I would have had to sort of commit myself to either this is all a fraud mm. or there's nothing to see here. Mm. When what I really needed to do was to work through that in a way where I could say I'm I'm sort of changing my mind from day to day sometimes on this, and I had to have the space to do it. I think yeah. a social media sort of environment commits people sometimes to um, a viewpoint that they're actually wanting to think through. Yes, yes. And no, that's, that's really uh, wise. I've been guilty of that. <laughs> Don't look at my old Facebook post. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> well, uh, Dr. Moore, seriously, it's been a true privilege to get you on. Um, I really appreciate you making time for us. Where can people find you? Where, what are you doing these days? Are you online? Plug away. 
Uh, I'm at uh, Christianity Today and uh, right there uh, frequently. And so you can find me there at uh, Christianity Today. Perfect. I'll try. I'll, I'll put a link into the show notes so people can click on it and see your writings. You really write great stuff. As someone who, again, might not see things all the same way, I really respect and admire your positions. Your um, your posture, I think, is oftentimes very um, well spoken and well said. And I appreciate you really taking on Christian nationalism headlong um, or headstrong. Certainly, you and I are aligned there about about it being a heresy and needing to be expelled as soon as possible from the church. So, um, oh, I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.